So I'm going to give a basic talk about uh, assembly in terms of reverse engineering. So it's not going to be a talk about how you code in assembly because that would take way too long. Um, so first of all, this is me. My name's Sven. Uh, you can find me, or you can email me there, read about me there, twatter me there, or see me on Freenode on IRC, and then you can find all the GitHub and stuff uh, from there. So I'm going to go over the basic x86 architecture, kind of like what you're going to be needing to know. Calling conventions. Uh, can I just ask who's like programming apart from you? Who else does like programming or has done programming? Good, you have. Okay, so it's a bit of basic, kind of assumes very little knowledge. So, I'm going to go over some of the basic ops. Uh, there's actually only seven you really need to know to get started, surprisingly, but there are a lot more, but you can sort of pick those up as you go. We're going to go over how to identify some common constructs, loops, switch statements, and the like, because they do, you know, they're quite helpful to sort of be able to recognize uh, as you're going through the uh, assembly code. And there's going to be some cats. They will. And if you have any questions at any point, just you know, ask, or if anything's confusing you, or if you want me to slow down or whatever, just let me know. So why do we reverse engineer? Well, sometimes we don't know how stuff works, and we want it to know how stuff works in order to be able to plug our own things in or make it work with the things we already have. And we can't because we don't know anything about it. So we look into it, reverse engineer, to get interoperability with other software, other hardware even, other communication protocols and such. We just want to know how it works. Curious as we are, um, we like to delve into <coughs> systems and figure out exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it. Key gen cracks, I'm sure we've all had our fair shares of key gens and cracks, so you reverse engineer the serial generation protocol uh, or algorithm to get your key gens or the copy protection, or the 30-day the, the timeout to generate your cracks. Exploit development. Um, so any sort of binary exploits can be found, are probably easier found if, you have, if you're targeting open source software. You're looking through the st basic code, you can find all your vulnerable operations like string copies, or allocations and deallocations or whatever, but sometimes you don't have that code. So you've got to find some sort of entry point reverse engineer it and see if you can find uh, any possibility of exploiting the uh, application. And then also proprietary file formats. A lot of software uses file formats that aren't um, documented publicly, um, but we do want open source tools to be able to read those file formats. So we can actually look at these files and reverse engineer exactly how they're being read and what they contain. So I'm going to make a few assumptions about um, what you guys or folks know. You don't understand data types and sizes, bits, bytes, words, D words, Q words, and what all, whatever. Uh, you understand hexadecimal notation and endianness, familiar, so that's in you know, big and uh, large and small endian. Everything's going to be an Intel syntax. So I'm not going to go over AT&T syntax. These are kind of two flavors of x86 assembly. I like Intel. Uh, it's a bit odd because of the way the operands are ordered, but AT and T syntax is a bit noisy. But you, it's good to know both ultimately, but Intel is quite common. And you've programmed something before I've seen a program, uh, I source code, not obviously the compiled software at the end. Okay, so I'm going to go over the first thing. One of the most important things about um, software is, or the way programs run is the stack. Now the stack is an area of memory that the OS gives to your program. And it sort of grows and shrinks uh, as the program runs. It's a last in, first out data structure. So anything that goes in goes on top, and anything that goes out comes off the top. So nothing, you can't take anything out from anywhere in between. It grows from upper memory addresses to lower memory addresses. And this is often quite confusing because a lot of diagrams show the stack as a stack growing like this, like a stack would. But that's your low memory and that's your high memory. So sometimes they draw it upside down. So you just kind of have to get your head around that. Hmm? And then there's going to be a big mention about the stack pointer, which we'll go over in the registers later on. Uh, and it's basically used for just keeping track of function calls. It's used for passing arguments to other functions and to allocate local variables to each function. 
and every function that runs will have its own stack frame, i.e. a portion of the stack is allocated or freed or assigned to that. Then there's the heap, which is essentially like the stack, but it's used for dynamic memory allocation. And that grows from low memory addresses up to the high memory towards the stack. Uh, the other sections here is BSS, which is uninitialized uh, static variables. So something like char star string without being initialized. This data section is the initialized static variables. So the same as if you have char star string equals whatever. And then that's your actual program code in memory. And then moving on, so we're going to cover the registers now. So these are on these registers on the CPU, which are basically behave like small chunks of memory, and they're really fast. So there's four general purpose registers, six segment registers, five index registers, or sorry, five index and pointer registers. And you'll probably see the general purpose and index registers used more than the segment registers in sort of early on. So the general purpose registers are EAX, which is often used for return values, EBX, which is the base register for memory access, so you'll often have a value in there which points to a place in memory, and then you'll be working from that point uh, with offsets. ECX is often used as a loop counter, and EDX as a data register for string operations that being said, though, you could use them for whatever you want. I mean, they're general purpose, but these are kind of sort of the guidelines as well as the compiler will use them for. The segment registers are two letter abbreviations. Um, and like I said, they're normally just used for like addressing video memory or far memory uh, and pointing to the code, data and stack segments of your layout in memory. The index registers are quite important to know. So EDI is your destination index. So any array operations will be used, EDI will be used as a destination uh, in memory, and ESI the source. So these will often be seen together when you're moving data around. EBP, the base pointer, is the points to the base of the stack, the current stack frame. So that will move up and down as you're calling through functions. And ESP points to the top of the stack. So the two of them kind of, they start off together, and then as the program runs, they'll sort of grow apart. But we're going to go over how the stack looks at runtime later on. And then EIP, which anyone who's done any exploit development uh, will recognize as the instruction pointer, which basically points to the next instruction to be executed. So when, you're ha when you have exploit that smashed the stack back in the old days before ASLR and stack canaries and NX and whatever, you could easily just um, overwrite sections of memory that you weren't supposed to, and therefore overwrite the stack, overwrite the stored instruction pointer, and when the function returns, you'll end up in wherever that instruction pointer points, which will probably be in your shellcode. And that's kind of the basics of how these uh, stack exploits work. So these are 32-bit registers. So the E stands for extended. On a 16-bit machine, you basically just drop the E and you have your 16-bit registers. But even on a 32-bit machine, you can access these um, registers in the 32-bit address space, the 16-bit, which is the CX, or you have the high and low 8-bit um, registers for each of these as well. So you'll often see data being moved into either one of those, depending on the size of the um, data being moved around. 64-bit is twice as good as 32-bit, and basically they're just going to be called RBP and RCX instead of E. And then we finally have the flags register, which is one big register which holds uh, 22 flags in total, which store operations. So they're binary flags, they're either one or zero. And the ones you're probably going to care about most are the zero flag and the sign flag. And the zero flag gets set to one, if the previous operation results in a zero result, and the sign flag will get set to one if the previous operation results in negative value. Um, conditional jumps, basically, is what this kind of leads to. So, moving on, calling conventions. So calling conventions are basically how, your, how the compiler or how the assembly code calls the next function or steps through the functions. 
This one's called, well, I call it C-Decl, C-D-E-C-L, whatever. But um, the key for this one is the arguments are passed on the stack right to left. So if you have a function call with three arguments, they'll get pushed on the stack from the right side to the left. So the leftmost one is at the top. And then the return values will get passed back to the caller in EAX. And it's the responsibility of the calling function to clean up the stack when the function returns. This allows for variadic functions, which means variable number of arguments, because the person calling the function knows how many arguments are being passed and is therefore able to be able to clean up that number of arguments. Conversely, a uh, standard call, or the win API call, as it's also known, the part arguments and the return values are the same, but in this case, it's the called function, the call e, that cleans up the stack. Hence, no variadic functions. <coughs> Fast call. So in this case, the first two or three 32-bit or smaller values are passed directly in um, registers. And it's fast call because these are a lot quicker to access than stack. The rest are then going to go in onto the stack. Uh, and here, the calling function usually cleans the stack. And then we finally, we've got this call, um, which only really exists on non-static member functions uh, of C++ classes. Uh, the first argument in ECX is the, this pointer. If anyone's ever done any C++ programming, you always get passed a reference to the current object <coughs> you're operating on. And again, the called function cleans the stack. So no variadics. That one? Yeah, but for C++. No, that's the only C++. This call is like a C++ flavor. <laughs> so then we're going to go some of the basic uh, operand or operands. So, hmm? It's a mess. <laughs> yeah. Um, for every operation, there'll be operands, and there's uh, three types. There's immediates, which are just standard numbers you know, any sort of uh, OX3F. There's registers, which is uh, the register value itself. And there's memory addresses. So this is actually the uh, memory reference. So if, you're, if you look in this point in your memory, the value at that address will get operated on. And the same with the value at EAX will resolve to an address, which will then be the operand. And there's also offset types. So we can do the same with the memory and then basically offset by four bytes. And SIB addressing, which is again an offset, but we do multiplication and addition. So you can you know, use the register values to create this kind of offset into the memory, of, uh, into the memory structure at that address. So the seven ops, there's the move command the add and subtract, so there's actually more than seven, but I mean add and subtract, we'll count them as one. Uh, compare, test, conditional jumps and regular jump, push and pop, bitwise ops, so and XOR or not, which is basically bitwise operators um, operate on individual bits of the data. So the move command can take any one of these forms, so your operate, this is your destination operand and this is your source. So you're going to move the, va the data in or the value of ECX into e EAX. In at and syntax, this is the other way around, but there's percent signs in front of it and it gets all a bit noisy. So I just find this a bit cleaner, even though it is a weird way around. In this case, you're register to register, memory to register, immediate to memory, immediate to register, memory to um, register, and register to memory. So basically, and then obviously you can do immediate to memory as well. Oh, I've got that there. Okay. There, there is no separate store and load instructions? Uh, not in this case, no, because you can write to anything. Okay. Are you thinking of uh, ARM? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is basically allows you to write to memory or registers. Uh, add function this is pretty much straightforward. You add one to EAX or you add the value of EAX to EDX. It's, it's add and subtract or equivalent one just, you know adds and the other one subtracts. Compare, compare is a bit different. Basically, compare will subtract 
hang on, let me just get this right, we'll subtract the source from the destination. So we'll subtract that from that, but not store the result. It just throws the result away, but we'll set the flag. Um, well, it actually sets several flags, but it will, the sign and the zero flag will be set. So if the zero flag is one, we know that ECX and EAX are equivalent. So it's basically that's kind of how the compare works. It just basically says you can see which, which one is larger and you can see if they're the same. Uh, test is quite similar, except this does a bitwise and of these two values. So, and again, we'll set the zero and sign flags depending on the result of the bitwise and. The result, again, discarded, doesn't, you're not, you don't need it. And then after the, you do a compare or a test, you'll often find these conditional jumps, and there's quite a lot. So conditional jumps will basically, there'll be an address here or a register memory value. And it will jump to that considering if, if it's jump, if zero. So if the zero flag is one, we'll take the jump. J and Z, if the zero flag is zero, we'll take that jump. Jump or above, jump above equal, jump below, jump below equal. And I think this was auto-corrected to something else. I can't remember now. <laughs> Or jump below and not equal, I don't know. But yeah, um, and there's lots, there's, um, there's quite a large variety of, of, of conditional jumps, but they all start with J and you can kind of extrapolate what the individual letters mean. Push and pop, um, these only have one operand and basically they will put data onto the stack, push. So whatever value is in EAX will get pushed onto the stack. And then if you pop EA ECX, you'll get the value from the stack put, popped into ECX. And you can push uh, immediates and registers or all, all values in memory. Bitwise ops, again, you're doing a bitwise AND of ECX into EDX and the result gets stored in EDX. Bitwise ANDs of immediates um, and then obviously the NOT is just a single operation or a single operand. Um, right. Recognizing some common code constructs. Function prologue and epilogue. This is three lines of code that you'll find at the beginning and the end of every function call. And after a while, you'll just read over it because it doesn't really matter. But they're kind of important to understand because they explain how assembly works on, on a computer. So we enter the function and we push our base pointer onto the stack. So wherever the current base pointer was, you're now in a new function, the base pointer comes up and stay, it gets stored on the stack. Then we move the stack pointer into the base pointer, creating our new stack frame. And then we subtract whatever value from ESP, which you remember because it goes up to lower memory addresses, will actually put, allocate some space on the stack for the local variables that follow. And then when we're done, we move the base pointer to the stack pointer, bringing the stack pointer back down to where the base pointer is. We pop the base pointer off the stack, the one we stored earlier, and then we return. But the thing is, call and return have implicit ops. They don't just call something and then come back. Call will also push the instruction pointer onto the stack just before EBP. So, which is why you can overwrite the instruction pointer with the stack overflow, um, because it sits below the base pointer. And then, obviously, return will also pop it. But they're implied by the operations. You don't actually see the push and pops. OK, so a loop. Given a, a loop like this, a simple for loop, where we loop uh, an iteration of 20, incrementing x each time, and then we return out. So as I said, ECX is usually a loop counter. Um, they're easier to spot in core graphs than they are in disassembly, obviously. Uh, call graph, I'll show you a call graph in case for those who haven't seen one, but they are kind of weird because compilers do weird things. So I'm going to show you one on, on an unoptimized compile, uh, which is not what you might see on a different compiler or a different optimization. I mean, if you compile this with uh, GCC 03, you'd probably just see a return zero because it will just get rid of this because it doesn't do anything. So what you give the compiler and what, <laughs> what it spits out might not always, you might not be as what you expect. So this is our disassembled code. 
and you can see here this is the beginning of the loop where we compare this so all these EBP minus are local variables uh, this is an offset of C from the base pointer offset of 8 from the base pointer so that's our X and our I so this is our I uh, compared to 0 so that's our terminating condition for the loop jump less or equal to 1 F a3, which is here. And if, if it's less or equal to zero, we come here, we zero out EAX, um, we clear up the stack, we pop the base pointer and return. So that's our loop exit condition. But let's assume that we're okay. So now we're gonna go and uh, move these two local variables, uh, sorry, we're gonna move this local variable into EAX, then we're gonna add uh, X into or to that value. Then we're going to move the AX into the local value. So that'll be our X, that'll be our I. And then we're going to move our I back into EAX and we're going to add minus one because we're decrementing the loop. I don't, again, it's, you could easily have used a sub here, but the compiler chose not to. Um, and then we're going to move EAX back into our local variable and then jump from here back to here to the compare. It's not really adding minus one, it's using overflow, right? Yes, I guess. But, I mean, I get, uh, the other thing is all this moving data back in and out of registers is completely unnecessary as well. So this is, like I said, unoptimized uh, um, assembly. It's just what the compiler gives you. So that's what it looks like in a call graph. <coughs> there's an output from Adara which is a reverse engineering toolkit or framework um, there's our entry there's our loop condition and if, if um, we're zero we exit down here otherwise we come in here and then this loop here shows us that this is actually a conditional loop so using call graphs like this I mean IDA has them but I can't afford IDA so I use that um, okay, switch statements. Again, these will, there will be quite a few different ways of generating assembly code for switch statements. Um, one of the ones I found early on was quite interesting is called a lookup table. So they had this instruction. So EAX uh, was a part of a value that you entered. It's multiplied by four. So I think it was an int that you entered a number. And then they had this memory address. I was like, hey, what is it doing there? But then let's, let's have a look at this memory address, and we see this. And then we'll notice that these values, each, each of these words here, is an Endian formatted memory address. And what it does is, given the input value of what you gave it, multiply it by four, the size of uh, an offset, and add it to here. So, if you entered zero, you'd be here. If you entered one, you'd be here. Two, and then you, they would use this value to jump to the right case statement in your switch statement, which I thought was quite, quite elegant and nice. And then I thought, I'll see if I can reproduce this. So I did something similar by having an input where A, B, and C, and then a default case statement, a uh, default statement. And I compiled that, and this is what came out. It hasn't got a lookup table like that at all. <laughs> all it does basically <coughs> is subtract the ASCII value A or B from your input. And then if it's equal, so if, if, if the operation was zero, it will jump to FOB, which is here. And that will then print this string here, selected A. And if it doesn't, it jumps to here. We'll do subtract 62, which is the B. If that works, then it jumps to here, which will print selected B, and so on, except for that this one will actually jump to down here, which will print the default statement. So, again, you don't really know what you're going to get, but it's just quite nice to sort of see this is kind of what these switch <coughs> statements look like in assembly code. And you'll see that, you know, we've got our... We haven't really seen anything other than sub, move... Okay, load effective address is, is one I haven't gone over, but apart from that, it's not really much variety of uh, operands or commands. So the stack. 
So let's have a look exactly what happens in a stack when we run this. So this is what I've compiled. Two integers, calling the function add to add them together into another variable, returning that variable into the result, and then we exit out. And that's what I use to compile. So 32-bit architecture, no optimization, uh, Intel assembly, dash s basically tells the compiler to stop at the uh, assembly point rather than carry on and do some compiling. And that's what comes out. So here's our add function. That's our main. And there's our call to sim add. Um, so let's see what happens as we see the stack in action. OK, so we, we start off, um, push our base pointer. We move our stack pointer to the base pointer. They both point to the same place in the memory. So the stack's growing up that way. And then we subtract OX18 from the stack, which gives us some slots to put stuff in. And this is calculated at compile time for the fact that you're allocating um, three or four integers, four integers. And then you'll see here that from the EBP pointer, we're going negative, well, we're subtracting these values, and we're going to move these immediates into there. So that's kind of what the stack's going to look like at that point. Then we're going to move those values into EAX and ECX. So these are the numbers we're adding together. Then we're going to move EAX onto the stack at the top, and we're going to move ECX just below it, plus four. This is kind of, if you, you know, haven't guessed, this is kind of essentially a push op, but compiled as a move op. So essentially you could have pushed ECX and then EAX, and you would have ended up with the same. And then we call sim uh, add or symbol add, which is our function, which pushes EIP onto the stack. Then we push the base pointer, and then we move our stack pointer and base pointer to the same place. So I'm going to shift that all down so we can start with a bit more room. We subtract 8 from the stack pointer, giving us a bit more space. Um, then we move the... What was it? Oh, yes. So the values we pushed here are now going to be used. So they, they come from here, and they're going to be put into EAX and ECX. So that's basically the arguments you're passing into the function. Then they're going to be moved into the local variables, um, which are assigned here. And then we're going to move our, one of the local variables into EAX, which goes over there. Then we're going to basically add the local variable back into EAX, which basically performs the addition operation and um, puts the result into EAX, which is our return register, usually. Then we add 8 to the stack, which um, basically cleans up the local stack, like I said, but this is CDECL, so we're this function is responsible for cleaning up the stack. We pop EBP and we return, which also pops EIP, giving us the exact address of where we're going to go back to. So now execution resumes at the end. We zero out, so an XOR of, of any value with itself is, is zero, so we zero out ECX. We move the return value into our local variable, which is R. Um, put zero into EAX because our main function returns zero. We clean the stack by adding the 18 we subtracted at the start, pop the base pointer and return, and we're done. And that kind of is, is what I was going to go over as a sort of beginner thing. I hope it wasn't too non-beginner. Um, and then there's a plan to have another one where I'll probably go over looking at like a real world example, like a beginner kind of style. Uh, any questions? Anything you would like me to go over? Anything that's really confused you? Uh, with my own code? Not yet. So what if you have like an array of function pointers and then like force it to like subtract? You could probably do it that it way. You could probably call it like literally put a call instruction there or something. Yeah. I mean like if you, if, you, if you spend a little bit of time just seeing what assembler comes out of a compile, it's ridiculous. As you up your flags and like your code just gets smaller and smaller and like you realize that you've yeah, the compiler is a lot cleverer than you are. Sometimes. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, now I wanted to kind of recreate it with a, with a switch statement and see if I can do it. But so far, I've not really sort of found the magic incantation to sort of get that going. So. What was it that used that octet? It was the uh, binary bomb challenge. So there's a, I can't remember the university that did it, but I think UCM, University College Michigan or something. And there's a, a binary bomb, which is um, a little 32-bit, oh, there's actually a 64-bit version now, lab thing, which has got seven stages, and each stage requires an input. And it just stands there and goes, you know, diffuse me. And you have to basically enter the thing, and if you get it right, you go to the next stage, and if you don't, it blows up. Uh, and it's a reverse engineering exercise, so you look at the disassembly. I've, I've got the full write-up on my webpage if you want to read it. Uh, and you go through each stage looking at exactly what it's doing and why it's doing it and what the input it needs is. So it's quite interesting, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can read that. I've also got a couple of key gen things on there um, for reverse engineering things. So, so that, yeah, next time I was going to go over basically doing a basic key gen uh, from a binary uh, with Radara which is, um, who's familiar with Radara? No one? Yeah? A little, bit, yeah? a little bit, yeah. So basically it's an open source reverse engineering framework, which is an assembler, disassembler, debugger, um, for multiple platforms, multiple architectures. I mean, the guy who wrote it has it running on his, what's the little watch called? The, not the iPhone watch, the Pebble. Pebble, he had it running on his Pebble. It runs on Android, runs on iPhone. Um, he's actually got, there's a, cow say, a dirty cow plugin for it now. So all you need to do is just load up R2 and you can exploit Android with dirty cow. And so. so is that a total IDA Pro sort of alternative? Yes. Right. Yeah, there's no GUI for it. I mean, the GUI like, is pretty much um, that. No, that, that doesn't work at all. It's pretty much that. That's your disassembly view. Um, your visual disassembly view. So you can step through this. There's actually, well actually, hang on a sec. If I can, do, do, do. Nope. Let's mirror displays. That might help. Yes. What's the magic key to, ah, that is it. Okay. Um, so, Let's have a look. I can't remember what I have on here. Uh, <laughs> crack knees. So this is one I did recently. So basically it brings you into there. You do, like this is not the right way to do it, but this brings you um, into that. Then you can analyze your imports. Um, your strings, if there are any, which I don't, well, there should be some. Oh no, hang on, this won't bloody work because it's, oh. sorry, there's not a good demo really for it. Let's try again. I blame the laptop personally. Look, I can beach ball. <laughs> right. Oh, this is, Yeah, yeah. You were right about this whole don't do it live. <laughs> uh, let's just do the A, A, C. Okay. No, that should. Oh, have I, um, is this a folder? Is that what I'm doing wrong? It is, isn't it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, without the highlighting, it's really hard. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Um, we can look at the. Entry point, we can look at the information of the binary. It's a bit over to the side. Um, of course you can, but this is all in one place. <laughs> um, so then, yeah. You can reverse your Linux binary on your Mac. Yes, I mean, as long as you're not debugging it, you can look at any architecture on here. So, so, so the debugger won't work for it? So. No. Okay. 
So th this is your visual view. Um, on, on the left-hand side, you'll see... Your so, actually, e score dot utf8 equals... Well, utf8, there's, it actually has utf8 arrows, which look a lot nicer than that. Um, so here you'll see, um, this is the kind of view you'll see from Radara, which your jump arrows, um, your memory addresses, the opcode, or the um, compiled, or the, <coughs> sorry, machine code, the ops, and then any sort of comments and, and strings that you have in there. And then if you hit V again, oh, uh, Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the function graph view. Um, you can also, let's, uh, do, do, do. You, can, you can use the mouse on this as well if you wanted to. Um, um, what, what's the right way to write a, um, let's say, a non-reversible sort of key acceptor, like the opposite of a key gen? A non-reversible... Oh, like, so basically this. If you're trying to write a key gen for something, yeah. what's, like, the thing that's impossible to write a key gen for? What's the right way to make sure we're a key? Just off the top of your head. Well, I think most of it will be about sort of obfuscation and, and possibly even sort of runtime encryption of parts of the code. Um, there's also dongles are quite hard. I mean, dongles are still in use. Um, also, it's not just about the code, but also about the architecture of your key and, and, and the software and how it fits together. Um, I guess the more, the more weird you make it, and, and I guess there's also other ways where people can have, they can have remote kill switches if they detect like duplicate keys and stuff like that. I mean, it was a lot easier back then because there was no online. Uh, I say back then when I was at uni, I used to use soft ice and do stuff. And but there was no online, so you couldn't have a key revoked because someone else used it. Because no one, no one knew. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, I do this as a hobby. It's not what I do for a living. So I'm I'm sort of not a professional. So I'm I'm still sort of learning a lot as I go through and whatnot. I think Skype used the method, the old Skype, not the new one, where they um, always uh, I, I call code obfuscating. They had pieces of code always obfuscated, and whenever before they called this piece of code, they had to decrypt, uh, yeah. obfuscate it, and called it. So it was not really uh, the problem was when when you saw it in in some of these tools, you couldn't just see it because not all at once because yeah, this you one has a debugger as well, so you yeah. can see it. Yeah, you could, you could follow it, but you would always go through the steps where it had to de obfuscate the pieces of code, yeah. and the other ones then obfuscate it again, so it was, was a bit ugly. Yeah, so your immediate view would be difficult, but yeah, when yeah. you figure out how to de obfuscate it, then well, yeah, you're winning it, but that's the hard part. Yeah, but still, still it, was, uh, it was quite successful. Yeah. Then, the old, it was the old Skype. I mean, the new Skype, they changed everything. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and they. I mean, one of the, there was a copy protection, uh, Spyro the Magic Dragon on the PlayStation. And that was, that was, I think it still is, it took the longest time to actually crack properly um, of any sort of scene back then. Uh, and the way they did it, that's because normally there's, um, for the copy protection on discs, you'll, you'll, you'll change. I mean, you can actually get around this by, uh, so somewhere there, well, further down, there'll be... <coughs> Do, do, do. Somewhere, I should do a search, too lazy. Somewhere, well, basically, somewhere there's a like, yes, you've, you've, you've basically got it. And at some point, there'll be also a conditional jump to, no, you didn't. You can patch that jump, and you've basically achieved the same thing, but it's more challenging to get the key gen. So what they do with the uh, copy protection is they often have checksums running on the code in the game. So when you, when you get a copied disk, they'll also do a checksum to make sure everything's okay and then work or not work. But what Spyro, the Magic Dragon developers did was they, they didn't have a checksum function. They did everything in line. So you couldn't just patch the checksum function. You had to find this function everywhere in the code. And then 
it didn't just break the game, it just made one of the crystals not appear in a level that you needed to get to the next level. So you had to copy the game, patch all the things, and then play the whole thing before you knew that you did it. And that was genius. And it took, I think, four months for, the, for an actual working uh, release to come out. So, yeah. But it's also price for developing this kind of stuff. I yeah. Mean, it, yeah. It's the way, I mean, if, if, if you have quite, quite, quite funds, I mean, then you can do, develop, can do develop. Funds and time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, but basically, I, mean, I think it's the money is the main main thing. I yeah. Mean, if you know you have a big sell afterwards, then you can do that. But otherwise, yeah, you, it's not worth it. But I mean, it also got quite a lot of interest because a lot of groups were just out there trying to yeah, okay, make yeah, this yeah. crack, yeah, and they true. couldn't, and so. Okay. But yeah, I mean, this is just like a sh overview of the of the tool. There's um, some other command line tools, um, like Rasm. Uh, which basically allows you to do, oh yes, uh, which basically allows you to compile uh, instructions into machine code uh, and vice versa, and the 89C8. So you can use that and there's um, RAG2, which um, basically allows you to compile shell codes and disassemble shell codes. Um, Rabin, Radiff, which is a binary differ. I mean, it, it's, it's huge. It started off as a, as a project to recover, a hex editor actually, to recover data from a hard drive. And 10 years later, we've got this IDA competitor open source tool. So, I think so, yeah. <laughs> it probably was this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, he, had, he, had, he wrote this tool because he couldn't find anything to do it and it kind of just grew. So this is, oops, this is Radara 2. Um, so, yeah. What other architectures uh, Those. I've got to make it so small, you can't even see it. Scalectrics. Did you say Scalectrics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a language. It's just made up of uh, dashes and brackets, I think. And, it, and I said it runs on, it's written in C, so it runs on pretty much any platform. Um, there's also Radara to Extras, which allow you to have more plugins, um, which, because the whole, the whole project is actually LGPL licensed. So any GPL plugins are in a separate repository and you have to actually install them with their package manager. Um, because the Debian people cried about it. They said, we can't have these by default. So, and I've, I've been working on the x86 handmade assembler, the Z80 assembler. Uh, and porting stuff over to the extras that wasn't LGPL licensed. So I, I contribute to this um, in my spare time. So. But yeah, check it out. Uh, always get the version from Git. Um, GitHub.com slash Radara, which is spelt like this. You see at the bottom? Well, not really. But yeah. Um, and basically, yeah, just. Italian? Sorry? Is it Italian? Uh, Spanish. Oh, Spanish. Okay. The original author yeah, is Spanish, yeah. yeah. Okay. It actually stands for something. I can't remember what it is now. Something data and recovery. Blah, no, blah, blah. Because, because it sounds romantic or something. Mm. And, and then the, now with better English. Oh, yeah, they have, they have the. <laughs> the fortunes are different every time. So. Um, oh, right. <laughs> that's yeah, I love the smell of bugs in the morning and whatnot. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, and it's it's customizable. You can change. It has color themes and and whatnot. So that's what I'm going to be. I'll go over next time is actually using it to look at that simple key gen, and then write the key gen. It's fairly, fairly complete, isn't it? Yep, got a lot of contributors.
and it has also has this thing called Esil, which is a VM, so you can load up uh, some you can load up a, a binary into R2, mm -hmm. and then you can configure your registers and stack exactly how you want it, and then step through the instructions as if it were running. Oh, so it's an emulator. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, but one that you control the entire architecture yeah. beforehand. Oh, you could use this for education. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, really good, yeah. Cool. Glad you enjoyed it.